Revelation chapter number 21 and verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Today I want to look at what lies in our future, far into the future, at least over 1,007 years into the future. And depending upon the length that takes for one event to occur, maybe much longer. But this is a promise in the word of God that there's going to come a time where there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. So there's going to be some things that has to happen before that time occurs. I made a video recently about the millennium. And in Revelation chapter 20 and verse number 7 says, And when the thousand years are expired... When the millennial reign comes to an end, Satan is going to be loosed out of his prison. Verse number eight says, And he shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them to battle, together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone with the beast and false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So at the end of that thousand year reign, before God creates the new heaven and the new earth, there will be one last rebellion. And I want you to notice this isn't just a small rebellion. This is a huge rebellion. The biggest rebellion that will ever take place, they will gather as the sand of the sea. And during a time when Satan has had no influence upon humanity for a thousand years, he will rise up out of that pit and he is going to influence people to turn against the Lord Jesus Christ one last time. And that is an amazing thought that people would still rebel against the Lord Jesus. But what I want to focus on today is what's coming after that. So when all the rebellion is put down, there's one more event that's going to occur before God sets up the new heaven and the new earth. And that's recorded in Revelation chapter 20 as well. In verse number 11, the apostle John writes, And I saw a great white throne, and, on, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. This is going to be an awesome time of judgment. Everyone who's ever lived, everyone who's ever been born that came from Adam and Eve are going to stand there at this judgment. Everyone who has not been born again, everyone who has not had their sins forgiven are going to stand at this judgment. And each of them will be judged according to their works. And I thank God I'm not going to face God for my works. And by the way, the only works that are judged here are evil works. No good works. There's no righteous acts that will be judged here. Only the wicked, unrighteous acts of sinners will be judged here. Those that have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ, those that have decided to hate their very creator, they will be judged here. And every single person will be raised up from the dead. The Bible says in verse number 13, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell. That's the place where the souls and spirits of men go that die without Christ. They go to a place called hell, a place where people joke about today. They've joked about it for years. They joke about a place called hell. They say they're going to party in hell. No, they're going to wait in hell in a place of fire and torment, waiting there, waiting for this final day of judgment when they will meet God and face a holy God and be judged for their sins. And we know, anyone who knows the Bible knows Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, there's no more gift. That gift has been rejected. The Lord Jesus Christ been, has been rejected by these people. And the only thing in store for them is death. 
death, a second death. The Bible says in verse 14, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. The Bible says, All those that hate me love death. So they will get what they deserve. They'll get death and hell. And thank God for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ that he would come and suffer on a cross and die for sin so men can have their sins forgiven. But for all those who reject him, they will end up in this place called the lake of fire. You ever wonder why someone says, go jump in a lake? That was a, a pretty well-used saying back in the day. They didn't say, go jump in a pond and go jump in a river and go jump in the ocean. They said, go jump in, the, go jump in a lake. And it was a reference to the lake of fire. It was a way of telling someone to go to hell in a kind of a nicer way, if there is a way to say it any nicer. There's no nice way to say this. I don't wish hell on anybody. But the fact of the matter is, there is going to be multitudes that are going to go to hell. And for whatever reason, I can't comprehend it. I think of the love that Jesus had toward us. And he, he shows himself to everyone. There's not one person that's going to go to hell that's going to say, God, you never let yourself be known to me. I never had a chance. No way. No one's ever going to say that. God's given everyone a conscience. And people that, that go against their conscience, sin against their conscience, and end up being a reprobate and go to hell, it's their fault. They have to go against the very, the very nature God gave them, the conscience that God put within them. And not only that, but God has his Holy Spirit that deals with every man. And those that resist the Holy Ghost, like Stephen, when he preached to those in Acts chapter 7, that religious crowd, just like the crowd today that's so religious, there's any name, any denomination, they're out there. Those that, that put down people because, oh, you're not accepting of a certain group of people. You're haters, and they put you down, and they criticize you. But the fact of the matter is, the one they hate is the God that created them. And they will be at this judgment, and all those that face God in this judgment will be cast into that lake of fire for all eternity. And those are the things that are coming. And just think of the thousand years that lie ahead for believers. What an awesome time as we're going to be raptured before Daniel's 70th week, that horrible time that lies ahead that this world is, is just going headlong into. And some people see it happening. Most Christians, it's, it's amazing to me, most Christians don't want to talk about it. Most Christians think, ah, oh, it's not going to be that quick. It's, it's off in the, in the distant future. You know, it may be five, maybe 10, maybe 20, maybe 100 years to Jesus comes at the rapture. But friend, if you, if you don't have your eyes open, you, you will believe that. But if you have your eyes even partially opened, you'll realize what's coming. And it's coming quick. Jesus is about to come and take us home, and all hell is going to break loose in this world. But after all that mess, and after the 1,000 years that Jesus rules and reigns on this earth, and we reign with him, there is coming a time where God is going to make a new heaven and a new earth. I'm just going to take some time and read down through this chapter and just look at some of the awesome things that God has to say about eternity. I'm going to read verse 1 again. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I want you to notice this little phrase, coming down from God out of heaven. Remember back in chapter 20 and verse 9, where those that had come past the camp of the saints that beloved city. Now, this isn't, this isn't the city here. This new Jerusalem is coming down from God out of heaven. But the, the Jerusalem that's on earth during the millennium, and they compass that city around, and there's going to come fire down from God out of heaven. Now, here, coming down from God out of heaven, is going to be this new city, this new Jerusalem, the holy city, that place that Jesus told his disciples back in John 14, he said, I go and prepare a place for you. And the place he has prepared is this, this great city, this beautiful city, New Jerusalem. Notice, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. 
And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Can you even begin to imagine this time? We have just witnessed the most awful event that will ever take place when all the secrets of all the damned will come out, all those who rejected God, all those religious people that acted like they were so good, so holy, so mighty, and now they're judged and cast into the lake of fire. And all those despots from all the ages, from Hitler and Mussolini and Stalin and Mao and all, all the people, even of, even of today, they're going to stand before a holy God and face him in judgment. And they're all done away with. All the former things are passed away. It's amazing. Isaiah even says about that they won't even come into, into mind. I think they'll be like a, like a memory from childhood, like a memory of being three years old. It's so, so distant and so faded. It's like it's not even real. As you read down through here, Revelation chapter 21, verse 5, and he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. If you go back to the beginning of the book of Revelation, you'll find in chapters 2 and 3 talks about the church. And it talks about the overcomers. He that overcometh, I will, and there's things listed through those chapters. And the thing of it is, John also wrote that we overcome by faith. It's the our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that he died for our sins that he shed his blood to pay for our sins, that he is our savior and he is our God. And he has, he's going to give us so much here in the future. But notice verse eight, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And if, if you're a Christian, you ought to rejoice every day, and I'm sure you do, that you aren't going to this place. It's such a relief to be able to live and understand that if your heart stops beating, if you're going down the road and, and some vehicle hits you and your life is taken from you, that you will go into the presence of God, absent from the body, present with the Lord, and we also have that hope of hearing that trumpet sound. And when the trumpet sounds, we'll be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, and God's going to take us up and we'll be changed. This mortal will be changed and will become immortal. This corruptible will put on incorruption. And we will have a body likened unto the Lord Jesus Christ. So the second death can't touch us. Verse 9 says, And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Now, notice how this angel... He says to John, I'm going to show you the bride, the lamb's wife. Now, who's that? Well, that's us. That's the church. And he's showing John the, the bride of the lamb. And notice what he shows him then. He shows him that great city. He's showing him that holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God. Now, where was that city during the millennium? Well, that city during the millennium was hovering above the earth. 
And that city is some 1,500 miles square. And that city will hover well above the earth. I don't know if it'll be quite as far away as the moon is from the earth. It may be. It may be closer. But wherever God decides to have that city hover above the earth, during the millennium, the only people that will have access to that city is the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we will be able to, to come to the earth and ascend back up to the new Jerusalem. And we will reign with the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says that in Revelation 2 and 3, how we're going to rule and reign with him. We're going to sit down in his throne along with him and share as we, we share in ruling and reigning with our Lord and Savior here on the earth during those thousand years. Now look at the description of this city and had a great and high, or a wall great and high and had 12 gates and at the 12 gates, 12 angels and names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Now it's an amazing thing that the 12 is listed here, 12 angels, one at each of the gates and each of the gates, there's a name of the tribe of Israel. And even though this city was referred to as the bride, we know that the church is made up of Jew and Gentile. Now, God has a land promise to the Jews through Abraham. But we see these gates are the 12 children of, the, of Israel. And notice here on the east, three gates, on the north, three gates, on the south, three gates, and on the west, three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And I'm sure that 12th apostle is the apostle Paul. But there's 12 foundations, there's 12 gates. And in Revelation chapter 4, there are 24 elders that are in heaven. Now it's my belief, and I can't prove it from Scripture, that those 12 that set on the, there's 12 and 12, two 12s, so 24. So I believe there's going to be 12 from the church age and 12 from the nation of Israel. They're going to set on those thrones that are going to be elders over large groups of people, over the great multitudes that show up that are praising God in Revelation chapter 4 and 5. Notice verse 15, And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city, and the gates thereof, and the wall thereof. And the city lieth four square, and the length is as large as the breadth. And again, as I said, about 12,000 furlongs, that's 1,500 miles. Now that wall that was mentioned, that wall is the equivalent of about 216 feet high. And he measured the wall thereof, 140 and four cubits, according to the measure of a man that is of the angel. So there, 216 feet high. And the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like on the clear glass. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third a chalcedony, the fourth an emerald. The fifth Sardonx, the sixth Sardis, the seventh Chrysolite, the eighth Beryl, the ninth a Topaz, the tenth a Chrysophrasis, the eleventh a Jacinth, the twelfth an Amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. I don't even know how big these gates are, if they're as high as the wall. However it is, but there's 12, 12 gates that are 12 pearls. One solid pearl per gate. And angels will guard those gates. And the gates will never be shut. If we read along here, you'll see that. The gates will never be shut. But there's angels waiting at the gates. There's only certain people that are allowed within that city. And notice verse 22, And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And everything that Judaism so loved, they, they loved their tabernacle. And again, that was a picture of the heavenly. They, they loved their temple. But now, 
those things that pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ and God Almighty, they are the ones that are the, the temple now, the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Now notice this, verse 24, And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. Right here, the nations which are saved. Now maybe you never thought of this before. I know when we, when we think of the time we're living in, we know that at the end of Daniel's 70th week, the end of the great tribulation that Jesus said he'll shorten those days. And that means he will not allow it to go past the three and a half years that he's predicted, that he told of Daniel. He also told John in Revelation 1260 days that he won't allow it to go past that because if he would, there would no flesh be saved alive. So there are going to be people that survive that most awful time, the great tribulation Jesus talked about. And those nations that survive are going to come to a judgment in Matthew 25. And again, this is a different time. This isn't talking about here. This is back right after Daniel's 70th week, right after the Great Tribulation. Those nations that lived through there, all those Gentiles that lived through that time, will come to that judgment of nations in Matthew 25. And it will be sheep on one hand and the goats on the other, sheep on the right, goats on the left, and the sheep will be allowed to enter into the kingdom. And those nations will continue. People will grow up in, in bodies, in earthly bodies like we have right now. Now, we're going to have our glorified body at that time, but there are going to be nations during the millennium. People are going to have children, and the earth is going to be restored as it was back before Adam and Eve ever sinned, with one exception, and that is the snake will still crawl on its belly. But... During that time, these, these nations, they will have people being born and they will grow larger and larger. And they will be the ones at the end of time, when, at the end of the thousand years, when the devil is left out of the bottomless pit, when he goes to deceive the nations, those will be the people that rise up and come against, uh, against our Lord Jesus Christ and against those in the earthly Jerusalem. And God's going to burn them up. But all those that don't come at that time, there's no place in the Bible that says they're given a resurrected body. They seem like they're just going to go and continue living in a body of flesh. And that would account here for verse number 24, and the nations of them which are saved. So these are the ones that come through the 1,000 year reign of Christ and they're saved, but they're not given resurrected bodies. They enter in to eternity in fleshly bodies. And these people that make up these nations, I believe will still have children. And it'll be much like the millennium in that sense. But notice here, verse 25, and the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they, now who's the they? That's the nations. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. So the nations, now that the new Jerusalem has descended out of heaven from God and come and settled upon the earth, and now everything is made new. It's a new heaven and a new earth because that first heaven and the first earth are passed away. And that's... I just want to go back and take a really quick look back in verse number one and make a point here. I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. Now, number one, this verse does several things. It destroys the teaching of a pre-edemic earth taught by those that want to teach a gap theory. There was never a Luciferian controlled earth prior to Adam. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, 
and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And evening and the morning were the first day. So the first day, that's the very beginning. There was no earth before that. That was the first earth that was made. That was the first heaven that was made. And now that first heaven and first earth are done away with. And there's a new heaven and a new earth. So this is the second one. It's not the third one. So we can see here that does away with that false teaching. So first heaven, first earth passed away. And notice there's no more sea. And the, the oceans, that's what causes storms. That's where the hurricanes and typhoons and things come from. And all those terrible storms that come from the sea, they're not going to be anymore. There's no more storms. There's no more things like that that go on. Don't have to worry about a hurricane. Don't have to worry about a tornado. Don't have to worry about any destruction like that at all. That's all done away with and everything's made new. But yet there's going to be people that enter in to this e eternal state that are going to come in and they're going to be these nations and they're going to bring their glory and honor into that new Jerusalem. And notice this, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So only those of us who have our names written in the Lamb's book of life. Now those nations, they too can have their names written there as well. I want to do is just look back and kind of equate what, what John was seeing here. And John saw the angel took him, showed him the bride, the lamb's wife. And what he showed him was not what we would think would, that he would show him the people and things like that. But he showed John the city, the new Jerusalem. Now, way back in Ephesians, there's chapter 1, verse 10 says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. So in Christ, now we know that during this dispensation, the, the church, Jew and Gentile, we are in Christ. And we will be gathered together at the rapture. But what about those people before the flood? The antediluvian age. What, what about those people? Well, they're going to be gathered together as well. They're going to be in heaven with us. And the the Jews that came from Abraham and every saved person that came before the cross in that dispensation of law, <coughs> every one of them are going to be gathered together. And God is putting together the whole family of God for all eternity. <clears throat> in Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 7 says, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Now this is written particularly to the church where he's raised us up, according to verse 6, raised us up, to sit together, or raise us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And in the future, he's going to show his exceeding riches of his grace. Can you imagine what God is going to do for us? He's given us eternal life. And that is, that's the most wonderful thing, to, to have eternal life, never, never dying. And we are not only going to have eternal life, but we're going to dwell with God in New Jerusalem, we're going to rule and reign with him for a thousand years. We're going to spend all eternity. That's eight, the age without end. There's no end to this coming age. The new heavens and the new earth will never have an end. They will go on forever and ever and ever. And we can't even begin to wrap our minds around that. But we will, we'll be with God for eternity. And God will be continually revealing himself to us. And then his kindness. Can you imagine the place that he has made for us? And I have, you know, you, you can't 
think of how great it's going to be. It's, it's not something that you can think, and whatever you think, it's going to be better. There's a verse in, in uh, Ephesians 3.20. It says, Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. So whatever you can think, and I know this is talking about prayer, but I don't care what you think about eternity, how good it's going to be, how great it's going to be, how beautiful things are going to be. It is going to be exceedingly abundantly above all that you can imagine. So the most beautiful place you ever saw in the earth and every everything that you like, all the things that make you so unique, God has made a place for you in that new Jerusalem and you have a mansion not like the newer versions say you got a room. There's many rooms in my father's house. No, there's many mansions. And we know there's a major difference between a mansion and a room and all the things. And it's all, it's all made up exactly according to what God knows your taste is. And you say, well, that's, that seems a little wacky. No, I, I believe that's the absolute truth. I believe God has everything made up just like he knows we'd love it. Because God knows us all together. And he's going to do way better to us than what we could ever imagine or what we could ever deserve. God is such a loving God, such a forgiving and gracious God. And his kindness is going to be showed toward us through Christ Jesus. Notice, exceeding riches not just riches, but exceeding riches. We're dealing with the Almighty God. And notice it's of His grace. Nothing we do. Everything I have is because of the grace of God. I don't think for one split second that anything I ever did, ever, ever would incur the favor of God. It's by His grace. He loved us by His, by his grace. He died it was by his grace that he tasted death for every man. It was the grace of God that was revealed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And notice not only the exceeding riches of his grace, but in his kindness toward us. God is so kind, so merciful, so gracious, so loving. And it's all through Christ Jesus. It's not through anyone else. It's all about Jesus. So in eternity, that new Jerusalem that God has created, that place that there will be no more pain, no more crying, no more suffering, none of that. It's all done away with for us. And we'll be with Jesus Christ for eternity. And it's going to be way better than what you could ever imagine. All the pain of this life, all the troubles of this life are gone forever. And we're with our great God back to Ephesians chapter 2 and I'll just go ahead and read I was going to read verse 16 but this is such a good verse and that he might reconcile both and this is talking Jew and Gentile onto God in one body by the cross now notice both Jew and Gentile reconciled both of us and it's in one body by the cross and that one family in heaven that's why in that new Jerusalem, that's why there's 12 gates. And those 12 gates have the 12 tribes of Israel, their names on those 12 gates. That's why the body, there's 12 foundations and there are 12 apostles. And 11 of those apostles, well, all, all 12 are Jewish, but the, there's 11 that went to the circumcision, to the Jews. And the one that went to the uncircumcision, the apostle Paul, He's the only Gentile that's going to be on that new Jerusalem. But there's going to be the bride of Christ that is through this age that is going to live in that city. And that the angel says, I'm going to show you the bride. And he shows him that city. Notice this. He's reconciled both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby and came and Preach peace to you which were afar off, and that's the Gentiles, and to them that were nigh, that's the Jews. For through him 
we both, Jew and Gentile, have access by one spirit unto the Father. And here's where I wanted to get to. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. So this great household of God, all those saints from, from Adam and Eve and Abel and Seth, all the way up through the, the thief on the cross, who, who, uh, well, the thief on the cross, that's rough, rough where to put him at. I guess he would have to be in the New Testament, but up to the, the last person who put their faith in God and had their sins forgiven before Jesus Christ died on that cross. All those people from all the other dispensations are going to be gathered together. It's going to be one household, one household of faith. We're all part of that, that family of God. And notice this, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Now, what's the New Jerusalem have for a foundation? The 12 apostles. And the gates, well, they're the 12 tribes of Israel. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And it's all about Jesus. He's the one that, according to this, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. So we are the bride of Christ. We are the habitation of God. And God is going to live in that new Jerusalem. He's the light of it. God the Father and God the Son in that, that, new, that new Jerusalem, that city, Whose, whose builder and maker is God. The one that Abraham looked for a city whose builder and maker was God. And I believe that's in Hebrews chapter 11. Back to the book of Revelation. And we just read, read this, but Revelation 22 and this is where it gets a little difficult, and it's, I'll just read it and tell you what I think here. Verse 1, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb, and in the midst of the street of it. And on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Now, right here is where it gets a little difficult here. And this, this is hard to understand because right here when it says the leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations. Now, remember back in chapter 21, we read in verse number four, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. But here, it says, there's going to be healing of the nations. Now, that leaves it pretty open-ended here. And for me, I'm thinking the nations that come into eternity... I believe, again, like I said, I believe there's going to be people that come into that time that are that have not been given a resurrected body. They've not faced the things we have in our lifetime with the devil and the influences of the devil because during the thousand years that they're here on this earth, those who live through that time, they've never been tempted by the devil. They've never had to, to be exposed to the things that we're exposed to now. It's a totally different time. And those that do not rebel at the end, they will enter into this, this age of eternity. And apparently, those people in those bodies will need healing. And that is what the leaves of that tree of life are for. They're for the healing of the nations. Now notice, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it and his servant shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, 
and they need no candle, neither the light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And he said unto me, These things are faithful, these sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must surely be done. Behold, I come quickly, blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Now this again, this isn't dealing with this particular time here. This is just God wrapping up his message to John, telling him that he's coming quickly. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou, do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. Worship God. And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. And right here, this is the major difference between Daniel and Revelation. This book is not sealed. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he that is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Now right here, this verse right here, I've heard different preachers, good preachers that that are no doubt saved, love the Lord. I've heard them make remarks about this verse that this was a mistranslation. This, this shouldn't have been translated this way because this sounds like works. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life. Well, this is not a mistranslation. This is saying exactly what God meant for it to say. Now, this, this has to do with a particular time. This has to do when this new Jerusalem is going to be on this earth. It's coming out of heaven from God after God burns this earth up, redoes everything. When, when the great white throne judgment is taking place, this earth is going to be on fire. It's going to be burning. And God's going to redo this, this earth. He's making a, a new earth and a new heaven. And when God does that, then that new Jerusalem is going to descend out of heaven and settle onto this earth. And remember, the gates of the city, they're not closed. They're left wide open all the time. But at those 12 gates, at each one of those gates stands an angel. And no doubt, they're mighty angels. And it's only through those gates that you can enter into that city. Now notice, the ones that are allowed to, to go into that city where that tree of life is. Remember that river that runs out of the, out of the throne of God goes down through that city. And on either side of that river of life, there's the tree of life. And blessed are they that do his commandments. So this has to be talking about the people that are that make up the nations. Those nations that that bring their glory and honor into the new Jerusalem. They're the ones that have to keep his commandments, that do the commandments of God. And they do those so that they may have the right to the tree of life. So these people, if they keep the commandments, they eat of that tree of life, they will live forever. But notice this, for without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Now, if you never heard this before, this, this may make you stumble and you may, you may not believe it. But I want you to just think of this. Just look at this again. For without, without what? Without the city. There's dogs, sorcerers, whoremongers, murderers, idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Now I want to show you another section. Remember, now this, this doesn't say they're in the lake of fire. Notice that. It says without. They're without the city. But the other one, back in, back in Revelation 21 and verse number 8. 
down here and view the whole chapter. It says here, but the fearful, unbelieving, and the abominable murderers and whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And that's referring back to those that were at that great white throne judgment. But these, these here, they're just without the city. They're not allowed to come into the city. They can't come in and take of that tree of life. Now, what happens to these people? I don't, I don't know. They're, they're outside the city. Will they live forever? I, I doubt it. They'll, they'll have to die. They're natural bodies. And what will happen then? No, God doesn't really say. And that's that's my take on it. Maybe you see it different, but it seems to me, you know, it's, it's clear here where where God makes some some statements that are are kind of rough to to understand. When when we go back to verse two and it says the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations, that implies that there's sickness in the nations, and this is eternity. This this isn't the millennium. Some people want to say, well, this is the millennium. Well. No, because when is, I know there's no curse during the millennium, except for the snake crawling on his belly, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. Well, the, Jesus is going to sit on the throne in Jerusalem, but God the Father isn't going to be here, not during the millennium. Fire's coming out of heaven from God is going to destroy the devil and those that rebel with him at the end of the thousand years. So this is something different. This isn't easy to understand, and I'm not going to go beyond what what the surface says here, but you can imagine and that's think about what what's going to take place, but I I know that this this book is is true. There's no doubt about it. But there's some things coming in the in eternity that I think many of us have misunderstood for years now there's no more death for us there's no more sorrow for us there's no more pain no more suffering but yet there's people that are going to enter into even eternity in human bodies because these leaves of that tree and that tree that tree isn't going to be here during the millennium on earth now it's going to be up in heaven so those that keep God's commandments, they're going to be allowed to have the right to the tree of life. And they're going to be allowed to enter into that city, the New Jerusalem, that place known as the Bride of Christ. So kind of an interesting topic, but it's talking about eternity and Regardless of what you believe about this, it's it's coming. And after the thousand year reign, after the great white throne judgment, we are going to enter into a place like there's never been before, a new heaven and a new earth where God himself will see him face to face and will have his name in our foreheads. And I believe we will have a... An awareness, not only because the very God of all creation is before us, but there's going to be that union between us as the bride of Christ and Christ himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, the creator. And there's going to be such a bond there and such a fellowship together. And all the saints from all the ages will be here for eternity. What a wonderful time awaits us. And who even begins to know? what God has in store for us. If you have friends that aren't saved, if you have family that aren't saved, just keep praying for them. Keep witnessing to them. Keep giving them the gospel. Tell them over and over and over that Jesus died for them, that he's willing to save them. All they need to do is put their faith and trust in him because he shed his blood for them on the cross of Calvary so they can have forgiveness of sins, so they can have eternal life with our great God and Savior. God bless you. Amen.